Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Amicus Curie Lecture Series. Um, as you know, we very much enjoy sharing this series with the community, and we're very happy to see you back, all you people from Huntington, in addition to our Marshall students and faculty. Uh, you were handed these forms to fill out when you come in, and they're from the West Virginia Humanities Council, which has provided funding for the series, and we very much appreciate that. So if you could do that before you leave, that would be great. Tonight, I am privileged to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Middleton, Professor of History and Director of African American Studies at Mississippi State University. Dr. Middleton holds his PhD from Miami of Ohio, a master's from Ohio State University, and he's a graduate of Morris College with honors. Uh, he has written widely on race and the law and has written a book called The Black Laws, Race and the Legal Process in Early Ohio. He's published in documentary collections, uh, journals, encyclopedias. Um, he's, his publications have appeared broadly. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Middleton. Thank you. Ms. Proctor for this opportunity to speak in this uh, impressive lecture series at Marshall University. Thank you also, Dean, for this uh, opportunity. I've had a wonderful time since I've been here. I've spent the entire day here and uh, took a tour around Marshall University. And uh, thanks to Denise, where is she? Where is she? Uh, around uh, uh, Huntington. So I feel like I'm somewhat uh, a member of the thundering herd community. Uh, I've met some real nice people, and I'll remember you all for a long time. So thank you for, for welcoming me here. Um, can someone turn the sound up a little bit? OK, wonderful. Let, I, I like that. Thank you so much. Let me know if you need anything else. Uh, firstly, um, let me tell you what I want you to do. We do want to talk about progressive constitutionalism and the assault on civil rights following the Civil War. Um, while I was in graduate school, I became interested uh, in black congressmen as a research project. And being from South Carolina, you know, I wanted to investigate how it was that African Americans, so soon after the Civil War, were serving in Congress from my state, South Carolina. And as I got into the subject, I discovered not only were African Americans from South Carolina serving in the United States Congress. Uh, African Americans from other southern states in, were serving, including from the state of Mississippi, where I now work. Some of them were US senators. Uh, Blanche, Kelsey, Blanche Kelsey Bruce, for example, Hiram Revels, were senators from the state of Mississippi. And many others, about 20, 22 of them, served in the House of Representatives. So my question to myself was, how was that possible at that time? And only a few years later, there were virtually no uh, black Americans serving in the Congress of the United States. So as I began my investigation, I discovered, and I want to share with you what I discovered, and we'll have an opportunity to engage with each other over this uh, once I tell you what I, what I, what I found out. I discovered that the Civil War enabled the central government of the United States to do something about American slavery. Uh, before that time, you know, from George Washington into 1860, most presidents simply deferred to the states when it came to slavery. So instead of using some of the powers of this new central government that had the power to regulate contracts, it had the power to regulate commerce. The central government simply allowed the states to sustain the institution of involuntary servitude that had been legal uh, since the colonial period. Well, the war forced Lincoln's hand, as many of you know. Starting with the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln took a stand to limit slavery uh, in the states that were in secession. Now, of course, we all know that had the Confederacy won the war, uh, slavery would have continued. But nonetheless, the Union won. 
and the Emancipation Proclamation at least put the United States on the road to general emancipation. With the 13th Amendment, Congress declared its national abolition law, and it's important to see it as such a national abolition law because there had been regional abolition laws before, as early as 1787, uh, the Articles Congress had eliminated slavery, or at least prohibited slavery, in the Northwest Territory. So there had been regional bans before. Uh, the Missouri Compromise had uh, limited slavery south of you know, Missouri. So there had been re regional bans. But there was never a national prohibition on slavery until the 13th Amendment. The amendment declared that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the United States except those things, you know, people commit crimes, it could be subject, it could be punished in that particular way. And with emancipation, one would think that African Americans would automatically become citizens of the United States. But that was not the case. Uh, the 13th Amendment was not used to enfranchise anyone. Uh, black people did not begin to vote because the 13th Amendment had been passed. And Congress began to consider ways to strengthen itself as a, a political power party in the South. And many individuals, after having studied this subject, people at Carl Schurz investigated this matter by touring the South, talking to Southern whites. The Joint Committee on Reconstruction had also sent people throughout the South talking with Southern whites about how they felt in this post-Civil War community. What Congress discovered from various reports was that very little had changed in the South that many Southern whites were simply waiting for an opportunity to secede again or to assert some of the same principles that they had asserted before the Civil War. Congressmen, especially Republicans, began to ask questions, well, how can we extend our political influence into, in the South? And how can we successfully reunite the Southern states with the Union? And many people began to say, well, one way to do this is to enfranchise loyal people in the South. And many of these loyal individuals were African Americans. And Congress began to, to act upon that idea in 1866 when it passed its first Civil Rights Act in that year. Now, the Civil Rights Act did a couple of things. Number one, it addressed citizenship, and that's important. Uh, no one, no government uh, had ever declared before 1866 who was a citizen. So the Civil Rights Act passed in that year declared that all persons born in the United States were citizens of the United States. This was especially significant in light of the Dred Scott decision, where the Chief Justice in 1857, Roger B. Taney, had said at the time that persons of African ancestry could not, were incapable of, becoming citizens of this country. Tani also had noted that those individuals, if they were held in bondage, were slaves. And as slaves were property, and could be taken anywhere in this country without a federal law of any sort interfering with that. Well, Congress knew that it could not allow the Dred Scott decision to stand, so its citizenship clause in the Civil Rights Act was a way to counteract that measure. Now, there were some people, in fact, one of your senators, uh, from this, this state, West Virginia, his name, Peter Van Winkle, I believe, had said that Congress could not pass a statute to confer citizenship. In fact, Van Winkle began to say this as early as 1864, and he repeated this argument in 1866. Now, it doesn't appear to me, well, at least it's not clear to me whether he was simply against African American citizenship, but he was making the point that one could not, that is, a Congress could not pass a statute and confer citizenship. What he suggests that Congress needed to do, if it was going to grant citizenship to anyone, was to pass a constitutional amendment to do it. But Congress in 1866 was unwilling to do it, or perhaps unable to do it. The Civil Rights Act was, was the best that they did, and uh, black people became citizens of this country uh, in 1866. In addition to citizenship, the Civil Rights Act also gave African Americans various rights, the right to own property, the right to enter into contracts, the right to sue and be sued. And it also had a, a, a clause, a kind of elastic clause which said 
that they would have the same rights as whites who were citizens. However, that act also became vulnerable because many Republicans in Congress were aware that just as the Supreme Court in 1857 had declared that black people were not citizens, Congress was aware that the Supreme Court, following passage of this act, could again declare that that act was unconstitutional and that people of African ancestry could not be citizens of the United States. So by 1868, Congress decided, the Republicans that is, to pass a constitutional amendment just as Peter Van Winkle had suggested as early as 1864. And the 14th Amendment is the one that declared that all persons born in the United States were citizens of the United States and the states where they resided. So therefore, citizenship now had become a part of the Constitution beyond the reach of, Con of, of the Supreme Court, that is beyond the Supreme Court, simply, simply nullifying it as a statute. This constitutional amendment also addressed other matters. It did a little more with federalism than even Lincoln had done. Remember, so that Lincoln used the Civil War as an opportunity to enlarge federal powers, using the war powers in the Constitution to declare slavery unconstitutional in the states that were in rebellion. This was an enlargement of federal powers. Congress, with the 14th Amendment, tried to do something in addition to that, to curb state power. And what it did, and many of you know the amendment, uh, the first clause addressed citizenship. The second clause placed clear limits on the states. The second clause says, no state shall, the restraint, no state shall do certain things. What could they not do? They could not uh, deny a person, a citizen, equal protection of the law. They could not deny a person certain privileges and immunities. And they could not deny a citizen life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So the 14th Amendment clearly placed limits on the states and its uh, citizens. And we have looked at two legislation. We've looked at Civil Rights Act of 66. We've looked at the 14th Amendment of 68. And both of these, in my way of thinking, were highly progressive civil rights uh, measures passed by Congress at this time. But Congress did not stop there. In 1875, Congress passed its most comprehensive civil rights legislation to date. And that statute, address public accommodations. What it said in effect was that persons of African ancestry, citizens of this, of this country, had equal access to all public places, such as theaters, opera houses, parks, public transportation, networks, and the like. So therefore, upon passage of this law, African Americans throughout the country as far west as California, as far north as New York, and various places in the south, attempted to board uh, trains on a non-segregated basis, attempted to enter into theaters, into restaurants, and other places. And what they discovered, that the proprietors of these establishments denied them access. So therefore, litigation started uh, during this period, African Americans, and their counsel were going into court. And these courts, these cases ultimately were consolidated together in a case that I will share with you uh, in a moment. But I want to say once again that now in addition to the Civil Rights Act of 66, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, it was now a Civil Rights Act of 1875. Congress passed another measure and that measure became the 15th Amendment, which simply said that a state could not, without penalty of course, deny an individual the right to vote just solely on account of his race. And that 15th Amendment secured also the right of black people to vote. 
Well, these progressive legislation were attacked, attacked both by uh, local people, by, by local whites uh, throughout the country, but especially in the South, who attempted to deny uh, African Americans access to certain privileges and also access to uh, the right to vote, to the, to the franchise. Um, these can be seen in laws that Southern legislatures passed that were collectively called the Black Codes. Uh, they included vacancy laws, so if African American men were unemployed, they could be forced into a kind of institution that was similar to slavery. Uh, black people were not allowed to vote. Uh, and the, the Black Codes were uh, created uh, what we would say was quasi-slavery following the Civil War. In addition to the Black Codes, there were organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan that intimidated African Americans, trying to stop them from exercising their right to vote. And all of these acts were an attempt, an attempt to return the country to what had existed before the war. In addition to the people attempting to minimize the rights of African Americans, the Supreme Court also supported them in a series of cases that is, supported those who wanted to disenfranchise blacks following the war. And I just want to share a few of those cases with you. One of them occurred in 1873 that had absolutely nothing to do with African Americans. It was the slaughterhouse cases. Uh, the case originated in the state of Louisiana where the state legislature had granted a partial monopoly to uh, a company that did the slaughtering business, slaughtered uh, ho hogs and cows and whatnot, livestock. And there were butchers you know, who would have to take uh, the business that they had collected, that is the farm animals, the livestock, to the central location to pay a fee. And some of these people were being driven out of office. They decided that these uh, Civil War, post-Civil War amendments, the, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, protected their rights. So therefore, they sued. The Supreme Court reviewed this case, and the Supreme Court, you know, as it looked at it, said, well, the 13th Amendment that the butchers had pointed to really applied to African Americans. You know, it emancipated them from slavery, so it's irrelevant to this particular case. And the court looked at the, the um, slaughterer's second argument regarding the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. And what they said was, what the court said was simply this that the 14th Amendment was designed to protect black rights, the rights of black Americans. But in addition to this, the 14th Amendment had only the ability to protect those rights which came as a result of their federal rights or their national rights. And the court also said that there were some rights that would accrue to citizens of the states by virtue of their state citizenship. So if you're with me on this, you'll notice that what the court said was that there was a dual citizenship clause in the 14th Amendment. Congress had the power to protect one type of citizenship, and that is national citizenship, but Congress could not secure any rights that accrued from state citizenship. Now in this case, it had absolutely nothing to do with African Americans ultimately spell disaster for African Americans because of this dual citizenship construction of the 14th Amendment. The court was showing that it was unwilling to use its power to secure the rights of African Americans. This was a very conservative court that was unhappy with the growth of federalism during the Civil War. And in addition to not being sympathetic to black people, probably wanted to return closer to the period prior to the Civil War. So the slaughterhouse cases was one of them, one case that I want you to, to note. The second case was U.S. versus Khrushchev. Some of you may recall that case. I've read about it in your U.S. history 
in, or legal history uh, courses. And this case involved the Ku Klux Klan. And the Klan uh, had pulled together in an effort to deny African Americans the right to freely assemble and also to exercise their Second Amendment rights, that is the right to bear arms. In breaking up black people that had gathered, um, those individuals became plaintiffs, and that case was taken all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. What the court actually said was that while the Second Amendment addressed the right to bear arms, it did not grant a federal right to bear arms, and that if individuals had um, lost their rights because of the activities of others, they had to refer to the states to address them. And the question was, would southern states limit you know, whites who were determined to, call, to spread terrorism among African Americans? So the Khrushchev case is the second opportunity to see how the progressive legislation of Congress passed during the aftermath of the Civil War were weakened following the, uh, by, weakened by the Supreme Court. In addition to Khrushchev, I also want to point to the civil rights cases. Now remember we have noted that black people began to exercise their rights to go into theaters, to go into opera houses, and the like. And when they were denied, many of them sued. And this combined lawsuit that included African Americans from around the country made its way to the United States Supreme Court. And the court spoke to the question, in particular, in 1883, once again, in the civil rights cases. Again, as the court, this conservative court, looked at the measures passed by Congress following the war, it concluded that Congress had actually passed a statute, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, that it did not have the power to actually pass. Now, in reaching that determination, the court looked at one of Congress's constitutional amendments, the 14th Amendment. And it looked particularly at the clause in the amendment which addressed the states. The clause said, no state shall. The court took that clause literally to mean that Congress intended to impose a restraint on the states. Congress did not intend to impose a restraint on the people, on its citizens. And if Congress wanted to do that, it had to do so specifically. So therefore, the Supreme Court rendered the Civil Rights Act of 75 unconstitutional. And what emerged following, if there was a violation of civil rights, the first question was, was this a result of state action or not? If it was a result of state action, then the court would say that the federal government could do something about it because the state should not be involved in restraining the rights of individuals. But if it was a result of private acts, the acts of individuals, then only the states could come up with a remedy for that. So therefore, there was progressive, once again, legislation that Congress had passed were just being weakened by the Supreme Court. Well, I think many of you know the rest of the story. By the 1880s, African Americans had reached a condition that are, that's generally called the nadir. You know that word? And what this suggests is that they had reached you know, one of their lowest points in history. But actually, matters got a little worse uh, for African Americans in the United States, even though the Civil Rights Act was still in the books. The 13th Amendment was still a great uh, constitutional amendment, the 14th and 15th. By 1896, you know, many of the state legislatures, especially those in Louisiana, were drawing up segregated you know, facilities. And the United States Supreme Court had the opportunity to make a decision regarding that in 1896. 
What it did in effect, what the court did in effect, was to simply legalize segregation by saying, as long as an institution was available to black people, and one was available to white people, there was no violation of the United States Constitution. And of course, into the 20th century, uh, two societies virtually existed, uh, one black and, and one white. Well, that's what I want, wanted to say to you regarding uh, the subject. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, uh, we have some time for that. Oh, well, um, hmm, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> well, what I would say is that uh, certainly the lawsuits were a response to black progress. Something changed following the Civil War. There's no doubt about it, no doubt about that. Structurally, something had changed. And what the nation was trying to work its way through was whether it was going to apply this, you know, these reforms or not, as, as Congress no doubt intended. But when I look at the, this whole concept of the nadir, I would say that, gosh, the, the whole of African-American life in America from their entry in 1619 until, you know, into the, into the 20th century probably constituted a, a low point. Not, not, not distinct, we can't, it's hard to distinguish that. That would be my response. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, there, there's, certain, there's certain things that happened from the 18th century, late 18th century, uh, late 19th century, and into the 20th century that has to be observed. And it seems to me that, you know, at each point, if you go back to even, you know, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, and you look at the structure of the United States Constitution, at each point, there were some individuals during these periods who were somehow enlightened. Now, it didn't mean that their communities changed suddenly, but structurally there were some things that were embedded into the legal system that didn't need to be in, uh, altered later on, but simply needed to be enforced. Um, then I look at the late uh, 19th century, uh, once again after the Civil War, I mean the 14th Amendment, that's great stuff. Uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866 has never been overturned. So that's a, a great law. But it was not until the court had leaders whereby the majority of them were touched by the same grace of those Americans who made structural changes early on. So there was a progression, uh, I would think. Um, the progression in the 20th century needed the progression in the late 18th century because had not Jefferson inserted those you know, those lofty concepts of nature's God and equal equality and the law of nature in the Declaration, and if it had not, not been for individuals at the convention, even though they made a number of concessions to the states, but they could have written something in the Constitution which says that persons of African descent could never become citizens of the United States, but they didn't. Uh, and had it not been for a awakened individual like John Bingham and others, following the Civil War, who could structure a 14th Amendment, then the Supreme Court in the 20th century couldn't do its bidding. So my response to your question would be that, you know, there, there are people to, at various stages in our country's evolution who are, uh, I would use the phrase again, or who were uh, touched by grace, touched by something larger, and they were able to insert into the fabric of our country some principles that, that, that no doubt will last forever because those principles are, are based on something that's true as, a ba as opposed to based on you know, just uh, uh, something uh, dealing with a person's passions.
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The court. The court did change. I mean, you know, the, the court of the of the Civil War era is not the court that preceded the Civil War. I mean, Tan is gone. Tan is has died. Uh, I think Chief Justice Wade uh, is the Chief Justice during the 1880s. Prior to him, Chief Justice Chase. Um, the court is, is different. Lincoln had some appointees during the course of the Civil War. But this court was still, you know, one can say, I mean, it, the, the question really is, was this court motivated only by race or was it motivated by something else? Uh, and it, you know, I think that this court was, was also motivated by its conflict over federalism. That is, what is this federal theory? What do we call federalism? What is this relationship between the central government and the states? And when you look at you know, this country from, uh, even before the US Constitution was adopted, when you look at it from 1781 with the Articles of Confederation into the 1860s, it's a country that somehow adhered to this notion that the states had you know, more rights, especially over social issues, than the federal government did. And the court following the war, I, I think, kind of adhered to that philosophy. It's a different court, but a court that was conservative and also conservative on race, if, if I answered your question. It is a different court, but it's a court that's conservative you know, on, on the nature of this union, the nature of federalism, in addition to a court that's conservative on race. Did I answer your question? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, like it did was point seven. Uh, yeah, um, the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the Republicans are still in, in control here. Um, you know, Lincoln, uh, Johnson had his his uh, his day. I don't recall Johnson appointees, but I, I, th I think asking whether it's, it's Republican or Democrat might not be the right question because the court, as a whole, I would think, was conservative. Now, why were they that way? My my response to the why is that some of them were, some of the justices, justices were uncomfortable with the way federalism had changed so rapidly. So we, we went from a, a period whereby the central government you know, was still limited in certain areas to the Civil War with the expansion of federal, of national power to the post-Civil War period with even more expansion. And I think you, you find a court that's trying to apply a corrective, trying to bring it back closer to what it had been so certainly, you know, I, I, would, I would concede that there were people who were conservative on the subject of race, but there were also some people who had some trouble with how far federal power had shifted uh, to the other side, and they wanted to, to offer a corrective. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, there's a, a, book, a book dealer out there, and uh, if you don't mind uh, following, uh, he would love to see you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.